Lecture number 17, Forerunners of Luther, Savonarola. I'd like to, uh, if you don't mind, since I rushed through the dealing with our friend William of Ockham and felt uh, I just simply had to do that because time was running out. I think if you don't mind, uh, I will take a little bit more time at the beginning of this lecture just to see if I can make clear what seems a very confusing situation. In certain ways, you would think William of Ockham would be uh, an example that Luther would avoid rather than follow. And you'd suppose, if anything, he would uh, have had an adverse effect on Luther. And it's very, very difficult to understand how a person like that could have been as it were, almost the major influence on him. Now, he wasn't. Augustine was far, far greater influence because of his writings and so on, but uh, Ockham was in the more immediate foreground of Luther's uh, life and existence and consequently uh, had more direct effect in his, uh, his age and had this thing. But uh, let, uh, let me try, see if I can explain. Uh, it's my own explanation, by the way, as I say, People have different ways of uh, understanding Occam's influence. There's no question it was great uh, there. And there's some specific illustrations, as is that Nutzliga idea that I mentioned, where there's almost a slavish following of uh, uh, Occam, where you would think that uh, Luther would eschew his example uh, completely. But the thing. Uh, I think of that uh, really had the liberating influence on Luther that made him so profoundly grateful was this point I was mentioning and I like to develop a little bit more and accentuate its centrality more than I was able to do in the rush of events at the, at the last lecture. This nominalism of um, oh, Don Scotus in the first place but William of Ockham developed it too uh, generally speaking, had a deleterious effect on philosophical synthesis and made uh, confidence in any kind of uh, system, any kind of coherent uh, philosophical underpinning and so on, uh, undesirable and uh, a matter of suspicion. You see, would it have a liberating influence on a person who is tempted as events roll on to a deep cleavage which the church, with the church which is claiming to have the only way of salvation. You must remember that people living as Luther did in the 16th century were generally under the persuasion that if they were excommunicated from the church their eternal damnation was certain. Well, you're going to be very, very careful in departing from the path that leads to heaven uh, uh, there and something is going to have to give you fortitude and if somehow or other you can suspect the whole pattern as it were because of its reliance on a kind of philosophy which you think is obsolete you can see what a powerful uh, liberating effect that would have and as I say uh, William of Ockham lived that way he, he would never try to prove the existence of God or the existence of the church as the vehicle of God. He would just tend to, if he took them at all, to take it on faith, to take it as a given and so on, and not bother with any debates or anything like that. Well, that's the easy way out and a quick way out too, and it would have an instant uh, appeal, and I think in the beginning of his life it did have a real appeal to Martin Luther as a way by which he could uh, question the essential soundness of the ecclesiastical system. Now, he went on to an attack such as uh, Occam never made, but Occam gave him a foundation for doing it. See, as an Augustinian, he would have been reared in the notion that this was a harmonious system, and it went back to Augustine, and it was grounded on Aristotle via Aquinas and such things as that, and consequently, to get out from it, uh, took some uh, massive surgery, and that surgery, that cutting of the cord, as it were, was something that uh, Occam enabled him to do, and he was ever grateful for it. As we come to Luther's life, we'll see that he got out from under that influence in the main, but not entirely as individual episodes to which I've alluded have um, 
indicated, but I'll have to let it rest at that as we take on now a different kind of person altogether, Savonarola. Savonarola was a one-man movement starting out like Luther's movement, but with quite a different ending. He has, he's almost like Melchizedek. He seems either to have beginning of days or end of years. He appears on the scene, a Dominican, and he disappears with martyrdom without any apparent uh, succession, without any movement certainly following from him, though his life was uh, heroic and his impact tremendous in his own day. Two, like Luther, Savonarola was a monk, though in the Dominican order. You remember I mentioned that was probably the closest to the Reformed pattern, next only to the Augustinian order. Thomas was much more of a Calvinist, for example, than Francis of Assisi was, or that other founders of the order were, and that too uh, sort of explains why a reforming effort could come to pass a little easier than if it were in a, another uh, order. Three, like Luther, his opposition to the hierarchy's indifference to Christian thought and life was surprisingly successful as the de' Medici's Florence overnight became quite zealous and moral, burning their vanities and soberly reforming their ways. See, the Renaissance proper, as we say, had uh, uh, reached Italy in depth before it even began to move uh, northern, and by the 15th century, the end of the 15th century when uh, Savonarola lived, it had uh, totally penetrated that Florentine area where the de Medici's, who later on gave a, a pope to the a line there, totally prevailed. And these people were tongue-in-cheek uh, uh, Romanists, uh, power-interested people, highly learned, and the last word in final culture, and Florence became a cesspool of iniquity when this Dominican monk set up quarters there and began to preach to the people and at first was mocked out uh, by them. Number four, but the way that all came about was as fluky as Savonarola himself was genuine. Before I show the flukiness of it, just let me remind you once again, church history is certainly an interesting study because very strange things do happen in it. And one of the strange things that happen in it is the great blessing that God sometimes brings through people who are veritable screwballs, people who have very, very silly notions, but nevertheless, uh, they may have a heart of flame uh, for Jesus Christ and they may be wonderfully blessed by uh, him in the impact which they make on the society of our day. You people living in the 20th century could give me a couple dozen illustrations without thinking about it of our own century on that particular uh, point. But uh, let me explain the uh, flukiness. The reformer of Florence had threatened divine judgment on the city's sins. He became specific saying it would be by the king of France. Number six, Savonarola didn't know that the miracle of predictive prophecy had ceased with the apostolic age. The Lord told him the king of France was going to invade that wicked city of Florence, that he believed that there's no question, that he had no basis for believing there's no question in my mind. I ever tell you about the sort of Savonarola who was once in a class of mine at Geneva College? And he said, the Lord told me to go to Geneva College. Now, I know that the Lord never told that boy to go to Geneva College. I think the boy knew that the Lord never said go to Geneva College. 
but you should have been there with 35 or 40 students and listen to the professor talk one-on-one -on -one for a half an hour before he could get that boy to admit that the Lord didn't tell him to go to Geneva College. I had to go over it and over it and over it again. Did God say to you in so many words, go to Geneva College? Well, he'd ham and he'd haw and he'd ham and he'd haw. But it was actually a half an hour before he finally, very reluctantly, admitted that God had never said to him, go to Geneva College. That what he meant when he said, God told me to go to Geneva College was, I prayed about it. I asked people about it. I pondered my providential circumstance with reference to it. I agonized about it for a long time, and I finally became persuaded that the Lord wanted me to go to Geneva College. And as I said to the young man, you realize there's a very great difference. Be say, saying what you have just said and saying what you had been saying, that the Lord said to you, go to Geneva College. Now, please be accurate and truthful in these matters. As you yourself admit, the Lord never said, go to Geneva College, so stop saying that. You want to show your gratitude to the Lord, say that you believe that after long searching and praying to ascertain the will of the Lord, that it was the will of the Lord that you come to Geneva College. I'm sure that's the truth. And it's not necessarily true that the Lord wanted you to come to Geneva College. And as long as you're involved in it, and as long as you're wrestling with it, and as long as you're trying to ascertain it, you know it's possible you've made a mistake. You hope you haven't. And that the Lord forgives you if you have. But you don't say, because I have deliberately come to the conclusion that I come to... Geneva College, I therefore should come to Geneva College. On the other hand, if God says it, you know you better be here. And absolutely nothing should divert you from your path and so on. Now, I don't think anybody ever went through this kind of dialogue with Savonarola of Florence. It would be very interesting to know whether he could have convinced Savonarola that God never said to Savonarola, the king of France, is going to invade, invade Florence. Or get Savonarola to confess, since there is a long-standing strain between Florence and France, and between the king and the de Medicis, and because this would seem to be an opportune moment for the king to invade, it seems to me highly likely because God is very angry with the wicked ways of Florence that he will punish Florence and use the waiting king of France to do it. But that, I think, is the real case. Uh, nobody said from heaven the king of France is going to invade the city. This is where I think God has a sense of humor. He lets it happen. <laughs> this makes me sound like an idiot. But God makes it very clear that just because an Old Testament prophet predicts something, a false prophet predicts something that comes to pass, that is no proof he's a true prophet. The test of him is whether he ever makes a prediction that's false. And you know if there's one false prediction all the other that might be right are accidental and not prophecies or predictions that come from the Almighty. But that's what I mean by saying that the immense authority and success of Savonarola in France was fluky. It came about by a non-fulfillment of prophecy that looked like a fulfillment of prophecy to an overly credulous Christian, and a frightened society. At any rate, number six, Savonarola, predictive prophecy, didn't know prophecy had uh, ceased, and he made that prediction. Number seven, 
God who is sometimes pleased to allow the deceived to remain deceived permitted the successful and sobering invasion of Charles. Sometimes, you know, people ask whether God doesn't deceive, and there's a passage in Scripture which indicates that he does sometimes deceive people who want to be deceived, which means not that he sends a falsehood into their life or from heaven actually communicates a lie, but when a people want to be deceived, God sometimes allows them to be deceived, and in that sense of the word, he does the deceiving. Remember at the very outset when we talked about the history we are studying now as a foreordained and predestinated history, and then wrestle with the question, how could God predestinate evil? Wouldn't that make God the author of evil? We said, no, God can't author evil. He can't do evil, but he can ordain evil for a good purpose. Now, here's an illustration of it. He can ordain evil. He can allow a person to be deceived, and in that sense of the word, be said to deceive, but not literally promote the deception, communicate a lie, but not correct it, actually allow it to go on. That's what he did with, Nick, with uh, Savonarola, and Savonarola looked like a true prophet to the people of Florence because they, in their superstition and in their wildness and their sinfulness, were not being obedient to the Scripture and judging their principles according to what God had actually revealed. Number eight, I repeat, the easily and willingly deceived people saw this as divine confirmation of Savonarola. They repented wholesale. There again, you see, it's a false prediction. It wasn't divinely communicated, but was divinely fulfilled. That led these people to be confirmed. They were capable of being deceived. They liked to be deceived. They were deceived. They were even deceived when it cost them something. As I say, the conversion was virtually wholesale. It went all over the, the town, and they just poured their jewels and all their fantasies that they were so proud of, that they'd accumulated under the cultured de' Medici city and so on, and it looked as if there was a real work of God going on there. It was superstition, pure and simple. But you know, if they were in the habit of computing statistics in those days, they would count the number of people who came down the aisle, the number of people who professed faith, the number of people who were converted. And yet the whole thing was a farce, a fluke. And yet, no one's going to say nobody was truly converted. And I certainly am not going to say muddle-headed saint. I've used that expression about a person who's living today whom I know very well. I won't mention his name here, but some of you may even know who I mean. A muddle-headed saint. Is it possible to be a muddle-headed saint? As we say, saintliness comes through the head in the first place. You can't embrace the gospel without understanding it. So you have to, in this particular muddle-headed saint whom I'm thinking of, he's probably a genius. They have brains to spare. They just happen to be scrambled, that's all. Muddled. So he hardly ever makes a coherent statement, but it's always done in a fascinating fashion. That's the reason he's very popular. That's the reason he's listened to constantly, even though, strictly speaking, muddle-headed saint. Now, is that possible? Am I, am I talking? Am I the muddle-headed person here that I can even entertain the idea of a muddle-headed saint? No, it seemed to be people like that. I, Savonarola was one of them. He really thought God was doing this sort of thing, a no basis for it, but that he was sincere about it, that he was ready to die at any moment and ultimately did die, a faithful adherent of what he taught was the truth of the gospel, and that he preached a good deal of the truth of the gospel. He's like the person we were talking about before who says, I seen something. He really saw it. He didn't know how to say, I have seen it, but he really saw something. I was mentioning that before. I didn't mention an episode I had that might be worth uh, relating here since this is another occurrence of the same thing we had noticed before. When that remark was heard by me for the first time, that I rather 
someone say, I seen something, if he really saw it, then I have seen something, if he never saw it at all. I was listening to James Bissett Pratt lecture, and I was also listening after that to Robert Letourneau lecture. Now, James Bissett Pratt gave me a polished Renaissance lecture that tickled whatever brains I have and elicited my admiration as a well-rounded, thought-out, articulated essay that left me totally cold. It was hostile to Christianity. There wasn't an element of saving truth in it, but it was a fine performance of a sharp Renaissance mind. Shortly after that, I heard this earth mover, Robert Letourneau, speak. Uh, he did violence to the king's English, but my heart was alive as I listened to every sentence he spoke. There was no question that he was a bit of a muddle-headed saint as far as articulating the concept is concerned, but I could sense I was listening to a saint there, a man who really loved God, whereas the other person who really loved culture and knew how to express ideas and so on, while he elicited my admiration for the fineness of his discourse, he left my heart cold because though he said, I have seen something, he couldn't convince me that he had seen anything, where the other one, that I seen something and I was sure he seen something. Here it goes again, though, with Savonarola. Number nine, Pope Alexander knew that if the Florentines could be impressed by one false claim, they might be impressed by an even greater false claim. He put the city under interdict, threatened, to, threatened the people, and excommunicated and arrested Savonarola. This is the way spurious conviction can actually fail the test. The Savonarola believed what he said, and the Pope didn't worry him at all. But the people, being influenced by a fruky phenomenon, as soon as their lives were threatened, as soon as their eternal life was threatened, they immediately abandoned that and fell in line again with the official church position. But Alexander knew how to handle a situation like that. He was working on the pretty sound conviction that most people will hold their own lives dear. And no matter how much they may be moved by a real servant of God, they're not going to follow him at the cost of their temporal, not to mention their eternal lives. Number 10. Savonarola's last words as he was being burned may have been his greatest and truest. You may cut me off, he said, from the church militant here below but you cannot cut me off from the church triumphant hereafter. That's what made Savonarola a true prophet. That's what convinces anyone that that man is a lover of Jesus Christ, however fanatical he may have been in some of his thinking about Jesus Christ. And it's also the only kind of conviction under which a true reformation can ever take place. I've said before that two elements that we're going to be seeing in Luther very shortly that are indispensable for a reformation is first of all to see the truth and the second is the willingness to, be, to, to die for it. Now Savonarola saw the truth. I mean he had element under understanding of the gospel. There's no clear articulation of justification by faith in him. He never reached where Luther shortly after was to arrive. But on the other hand, there was enough of grace and enough of trust in Christ and enough of elemental gospel that you can see he was a forerunner of Martin Luther who came after him with a far better articulated and fuller and sounder and systematic theology of salvation learned from the Bible itself. But Savonarola taught something to Luther that he had to learn, and that was something more than being willing to die for the principles you are announcing. Savonarola was being told as he was being martyred that he was cut off from the church now, which was awful enough. His life in this world was being terminated. He was going to be burned alive. 
He undoubtedly shrunk from that horrible ordeal, but nevertheless was willing to take that consequence. But the other threat was incomparably more terrible. We cut you off from the church militant now and from the church triumphant hereafter. I doubt if anybody could be a true reformer who believed that he would be cut off from heaven if he did it. He could believe himself to be a true reformer even though he was going to be cut off by torture in this world. But to believe that he would be cut off from God forever, that the church's verdict, that he would never be a member of the church triumphant, just as he had now ceased to be a member of the church militant. And they say, if you believe in heaven and hell, and you believe in a church of Jesus Christ, and that church claims to have the keys to the kingdom, and to determine who would be forgiven and who will not be forgiven, and you have any vestigial remains of confidence in a church like that, whether you are prepared to be a reformer when that church threatens you with eternal damnation is the ultimate test indeed of a reformer. So may I add that to be a reformer as Luther was about to be, you had first of all to think clearly and then to be willing to die for it and to be willing to run the risk of eternal death according to the accusation of the church you're attempting to reform.